All right, good morning. Let's stand and begin our worship service this morning.
pray together. Father, it is the Lord Jesus that we come to worship today, Lord. We thank you for sending your son to rescue us, God. We come here as, as sinners, Lord, that have been set free because of your grace, because of your mercy to reach down and to pluck us out of the fire, Lord. We are so grateful today, and out of our gratitude, we come to worship. And Father, I pray that we will settle into this now, Lord, that we will do business with you. And Father, we're going to look at a story this morning, Lord, that, that just when life seems to be unraveling, Lord, you are there. And Lord God, I pray today that we find you. God, there are people here today that are dealing with all kinds of issues in their life. Lord, the, the most important thing that they need to settle today is about you. So, Father, I pray that your spirit would invade this place, God, that we would get rid of other thoughts, anything that would distract us from lifting up the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray that, Lord, that your spirit be strong in us. So, God, we thank you, Lord, for a beautiful, beautiful day. Lord, we thank you, God, that we can gather together and may your name get glory because of our worship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You be seated. Good to see you Pickensville, Alabama this morning. I hope you've had a great week. It's good to have you worshiping with us this morning. Just a few things to point out. They're in the bulletin there. Family Supper, we're doing that every Wednesday night. Beef, we're having stroganoff, okay? Beef stroganoff. Uh, I'm glad Stacy did the bulletin this week because I don't think I could have spelled stroganoff. Uh, anyway, uh, so I hope that you'll come Wednesday night. Sign up for that and be here for that. Uh, also, the Fayette Aquatic Center. This is always a big deal. Everybody loves that. We'll go up there and just have the whole park to ourselves. Please invite people to come along, come with you. It's a good time to reach into your neighborhood. And uh, even if you're an older person, you don't want to really go down a slide, come and sit around and enjoy that time. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks. The last thing there is about the prayer tree. I put this note, I explained it last week. It has changed. If your name is not on the list, if you have not already told Charlie, you need to tell her because we're, we completely changed it. So you're not automatically, if you say, well, I've been in it for years, that doesn't count. You need to start over. You need to send Charlie a text with your name in it so that she can get you enrolled in that, okay? So that's all I have for announcements. We'd like to recognize birthdays. Anybody had a birthday since the last time we met? Nobody. Well, stand up. Let's have fellowship time. How about that? Go shake somebody's hand. Tell them good morning.
plates are here. Let's pray together for our, our giving. Father, Lord, we pray blessing, Lord. When we give, Lord, your, in, your kingdom increases, Lord. But not only that, we are blessed because we are being obedient. Lord, I pray that you would give us the heart, Lord, that sees what a difference it makes when we invest in something eternal, God. We invest in so many frivolous things in our life. But, Lord God, we pray that we see the eternal value of giving, Lord. I pray that you take this money, anoint it for great work. Lord, do things with it, Lord, that, that you, we don't even know need to be done, Lord. You open the doors for this to filter into the places it most needs to go. So God, we thank you that we can give, and we pray for our giving, and we thank you, Lord, for blessing us. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
perfect message for this morning. Take your Bibles. We're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel chapter 15. We are in our study on David. Uh, we've called it the King of Hearts. We've been going through a series of messages about the life of David. A lot of storytelling in here, and this morning is going to be much like that as well. We've got quite a bit of text to read to get into it, but I want to talk to you about when your world is falling apart. When your world is falling apart. We, we all have bad days, right? I mean, there are things that pop up on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, like one guy I heard about, he called 911. Operator picked up and says, 911, what's your emergency? He says, well, I got two women that are fighting over me. And she says, what in the world? Well, that's, what makes that an emergency? He said, well, the ugly one's winning. Okay? So, so we, do have, we do have times when we have bad days. We are beyond that with David. David's world is seemingly falling apart at the seams. We've been looking at this for several weeks, and today we're going to dive in a little deeper. So let's see. Let's see. Bear with me as I read it now. 2 Samuel chapter 15. I'm going to read it from the message version of the Bible. I'm doing that just because it's more of a narrative form, and uh, it, it helps to tell the story. As time went on, Absalom took to riding a horse-drawn uh, horse chariot with 50 men running in front of him. Early each morning, he would take up his post beside the road at the city gate. When anyone showed up with a case to bring to the king for a decision, Absalom would call him over and say, Where do you hail from? And the answer would come, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say, Look, you've got a strong case, but the king isn't going to listen to you. Then he'd say, Why doesn't someone make me judge for this country? Anybody with a case could bring it to me, and I'd, uh, I'd settle things fair and square. When someone would come, would treat him with special honor, he'd shrug it off and treat him like an equal, making him feel important. Verse 6, Absalom did this to everyone who came to do business with the king and stole the hearts of everyone in Israel. After four years of this, so this wasn't just like a weak thing, after four years of this, Absalom spoke to the king. Let me go to Hebron to pay vow that I made to God. Your servant made a vow when I was living in Geshur in Aram, saying, if God will bring me back to Jerusalem, I will, I'll serve him with my life. The king said, go with my blessing. And he got up and set off for Hebron. <clears throat> then Absalom sent undercover agents to all the tribes of Israel with the message. When you hear the blast of the ram's horn trumpet, that's your signal. Shout, Absalom is king in Hebron. 200 men went with Absalom from Jerusalem. But they had been called together knowing nothing of the plot and made the trip innocently. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he managed to go also involve Ahithophel. <laughs> that is not right. Ahithophel. Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's advisor, calling him away from his hometown of Gilah, in the conspiracy grew powerful, and Absalom's supporters multiplied. Someone came to David with the report. The whole country has taken up with Absalom. Verse 14, up and out of here, called David to all of his servants who were with him in Jerusalem. We've got to run for our lives, and none of us will escape Absalom. Hurry, he's about to pull the city down around our ears and slaughter us. The king's servant said, Whatever our master the king says, we'll do We're with you all the way. So the king and his entire household escaped on foot. The king left ten concubines behind to tend the palace. And so they left step by step and then paused at the last house. As the whole army passed him by him, all the Kerithites and all the Pelethites and 600 Gittites who marched with him from Gath went past. Then the king called to Itta, the Gittite, and says, What are you doing here? Go back with King Aslan. You're a stranger here and freshly uprooted from your country. You arrived only yesterday, and I'm going to let you take your chances with us as I live on the road like a gypsy? Go back and take your family with you, and God's grace and truth go with you. But Itta said, answered, as God lives and my master the king lives, where my master is, there we're, that's where I'll be, whether it means life or death. All right, said David, go ahead. And they went on, Ida the Gittite, with all of his men and the children who he had with him. 
The whole country was weeping in loud lament as the people passed by. As the king crossed the brook of, of Kidron, the army headed for the road to the wilderness. Zadok was also there, the Levites with him, carrying God's chest of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. They set the chest of God down, and Abiathar, Abiathar standing by until all the people evacuated the city. Then the king ordered Zadok, take the chest back to the city. If I get back in God's good graces, he'll bring me back and show me where the chest has been set down. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, well, he can do then with me whatever he pleases. The king directed Zadok, the priest, here's the plan. Return to the city peacefully with Ahimazar, your son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son, with you. And I'll wait in the spot in the wilderness across the, wilderness, across the river until I get word from you telling us what's up. So Zadok and Abiathar took the chest of God back to Jerusalem and placed it there while David went up from the Mount of Olives weeping, head covered but barefooted, the whole army was with him, heads covered and weeping, as they ascended. David was told, Ahithophel has joined the conspirators with Absalom. Ahithophel was his good friend, by the way. He prayed, O oh God, turn Ahithophel's counsel to foolishness. As David approached the top of the hill where God was worshipped, who say the archite, clothed, ripped to shreds, dirt on his face, was there waiting for him. And David said, if you come with me, you'll just have one more piece of luggage. Go back to the city and say to Absalom, I'm ready to be your servant, O king. I used to be your father's servant. Now I'm your servant. Do that, and you'll be able to confuse Ahithophel's counsel for me. The priests Zadok and Abiathar are already there. Whatever information you pick up in the palace, tell them. The two, their two sons, Zadok the son of Ahismaeth, and Abiathar, son, Jonathan, are there with them. Anything you pick up can be sent to me by them. We got quite a bit here to understand, and that is not all that I wanted to read. I'm going to have to... Anyway, I'll tell the story, okay? I'll tell the story. So for the past few weeks, we've been diving into this attempt of Absalom to take over his father's kingdom. It began, if you remember, because Absalom killed, he murdered his stepbrother. Now, he did that because the stepbrother Amnon had slept with, with Absalom's sister. So we have a family mess on our hands. It is terrible, and it is a crisis that is overwhelming David. And now it has overwhelmed the kingdom. And the people are, are unsure, their they're nation's in turmoil, they're on the verge of civil war, and all of this, David's world is literally falling apart. We are searching after a man with God's own heart. We've already seen that that doesn't mean somebody that's perfect, but somebody that responds in the right, right ways. And that's what we're looking at. So if we look at this, this story that spans two chapters here, we see... The, the details of all this. When we last saw this, his Absalom went on the, on the lamb. He went on the run. And David longed, it put David in a hard place because he loved his son. And he really wanted to be with him and talk to him, but he could not do that because he couldn't condone what Absalom had done. So it just, it was, it was a, a quiet time between father and son. It says there, for four years, Absalom would stand at the gate and try to change people's mind. It's a campaign. He's mounted this campaign to overtake his father while his father still loves him and is grieving over him. It, it, he's trying to convince the people, Absalom is, that David is not as competent a king as he would be. So he would stand by the gate. Somebody would come in, hey, buddy, where are you from? And he'd say, oh, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, and I'm from uh, uh, up the road. He, oh, man. He says, what, what you here for? And the guy would tell a story. He says, man, that is a, I understand you. I understand. And I tell you what, it's too bad I'm not king, because if I was running things, I would make everything all right. Sounds like a modern politician, doesn't it? That sounds just like one. But he began to win people over. 
and he went this hard and that hard, and they would go home and tell a brother, or they would go home and tell somebody else in the city what had happened, that Absalom is up there, and that guy surely gets you. He understands. You get, a, you get to sit down and listen to him. It's hard to ever get to the king. And as he began to win hearts over, he's preparing himself to when he can declare to be king. David hears about this. It finally gets to him, and he is convinced that he, he and all of his people are in danger. So, so they flee the city. If you tell that story that I was reading there, they, they go out, and, and it says that David stops at the last house. So he's right, right on the outskirts of town, and all of these armies are coming by him, and the people that are, uh, uh, are in league with him are coming by. And he's like, come on, guys, come on, guys. And, and that's the picture that I want you to see in your mind as they're coming out. He only leaves 10 concubines back at the palace, somebody there to make sure everything's taken. They would not be a threat, so they would not be in danger. But he had to leave somebody there. But all the others are fleeing town. So that's the picture. What I want us to grasp this morning is about how David handles this. And I want to talk about three specific things, three aspects, if you will, of David's response to this time. Because all of us go through difficult times but for some folks, you feel like your world is spiraling out of control. And I just want to say this up front. I can't completely understand all that you're going through. I never can. You could never understand all that I'm going through. It's just the way that things are. But that doesn't mean that you should not listen to my counsel because, after all, it's not my counsel. We are looking in the Word of God. We're seeing what this guy has done. And so I cannot begin to understand all the things that you go through. And so many times it sounds trite. It sounds like, you know, just lip service when somebody tries to help. But I'm just telling you, from my experience, this is David's experience, okay? And let's see what he does. So the first thing that I want us to put down that David does is that he finds true friends. These are not going to be deep theological thoughts today. They're just... If you ever face a crisis situation, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and just tell you that. You're going to be shocked by the response of some people around you. You just will. It's just the way that it is. It's the way that, because some of the people that you feel are so close to you and are so uh, uh, in love with you and they love the relationship that they have with you, they're going to pull away when things get difficult. They're, they're going to be cool to you. They're not, going to, they're not going to turn out to be good friends. And some of the people that are on the fringe of your life, that maybe you haven't had as much time with them, or you really, you're going to find that they become the truest friends that you could imagine. The same thing happens in David's life. David is there, and he's, he's managing all of these people as they're coming out of the palace, and, and they're coming by him, and he's, he's talking to them, and but we find out in our story that at least two people turn their back on him. One is Ahithel. Ahithel. I cannot say it. Ahithel. He turns back. He's, he's David's closest advisor, his best friend, but he sides with Absalom. But there's another person in chapter 16 that I didn't read that turns their back on him as well. And this is a surprise to me because I've loved the story of Mephibosheth. You remember the little crippled boy, Jonathan's son, that David goes and gives him a place at the king's table, and he had nothing, and he restored him and gave him all these things. Mephibosheth turns his back on David. So there's no telling sometimes in these situations who's going to be there. They are abandoned by, by, they abandon David and they run to Absalom. And you know that David felt defeated by this because these were people he thought were good friends. But I love David's response in all of his story. He knew that the Lord was in control. If you get nothing else today and your world, you feel like your world is spiraling out of control, take this from David. His world was in control by God. It does not matter what's happening around us. If you are a child of God, God has his eye on you. One of the great parts of the story is that David starts up the mountain to worship. I love that. He's on the run. He's, he's in danger. He th all the people are in danger. He takes time to worship and seek the Lord. Takes time. He climbs up the mountain. That's the way the story goes. He, he's going up the mountain with that. And he gets up there, and a friend is up there by the name of Husay. Hushai. 
So Hushai is waiting on him at the top of the mountain, and he wanted to help David. He says, I'll do whatever you want to. He says, I, I'm willing to march through the wilderness with you. I'm willing to, to, to do whatever it is that you need me to do. It was an instrumental time. You ever go through something, and, and in the midst of it, somebody stops by to see you, a friend, and they just kind of give you a hug, and they just kind of get you through it, give you encouragement or whatever. That's what this is. And not only does that feel good on a human aspect, but you know what it tells David? That God is still looking out for me. That I've not been abandoned, that he is there waiting for me, that he is going to make sure that the right people are around me. He had not been forgotten by God. That's because God designed us to draw strength from each other, to, to lean on each other during difficult times. One of the great stories in the Bible is, is an illustration of this. When in, 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 in Exodus chapter 17, when the Israelites were at war with the Amalekites, and Moses stood on top of the mountain, you remember? And as he would hold the rod up over his head, Israel would win. As he got tired and it began to drop, their efficiency dropped, and they began to lose the battle. Lo and behold, two friends come by, and they stand guard over him, and they help him to keep his hands raised. Aaron and Ur on either side of him helped to gain that victory that day because they were friends that held him up. When your, when your world begins to collapse around you, find friends. God will help you to find strength. He will infuse energy into you. He will use people around you in the midst of a trial. So that, that's the first thing that David does. Second deep theological thought here is that David does what is right. If you feel like your world is falling apart, do what is right. You say, well, that anybody would. If they feel like, no, friend, you, you don't understand people. <laughs> do you understand? See, here's what happens to us. When we get in the midst of something in our life and our life is not going well, one of the first things that we begin to do is we begin to focus on ourselves. And all we think about is our feelings, and all we think about is how somebody mistreated us, or all you think about is how somebody's got it better than us, and we have this tendency to focus on ourselves. And when we do that, we begin to make selfish decisions instead of wise decisions, and we tend not to do what is right all the time, but what is comfortable, or what makes us feel better. All of those things. A lot of times... It, we fail to see that our, our decisions will impact others, and, and, and we don't even consider people around us. I love this in David. David avoids that trap. He sought to do what is right even when he is in a tight, okay? Number one, put this in your notes. Here's some things David did right. He fled the city. Now, go ahead and write that down because I, I want you to catch this. It's important to know David did not flee the city because he was a scaredy cat, okay? David is no scaredy cat. He's the greatest military leader that Israel had ever known. He had fought campaign after campaign after campaign. He had the, the will to fight. But David thought about the other people. The last thing in the world that David could imagine was having a civil war battle in the city of Jerusalem. Because not only are those warring factions going to be killing each other, but you have all the innocent bystanders. You have all the collateral damage. You have all of that happening. David has in his heart to protect the people that live there. A war in the city would have been devastating. So David says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to involve all these innocent people around us. So he leaves just a skeleton crew at the palace. They, they're going to be safe because they're not going to be viewed as a enemies. So David is thinking for everybody involved, not just himself. Listen to me, guys. Sometimes you want to fight for yourself and you want to be careful that you don't cause more damage than you do good. David fled the city. Second thing that he did to us is that he offered up some soldiers the opportunity to leave. <laughs> Write that down. There were some of the people that came by him as he waited at that last house that did not have a long time serving David. One of them had just started yesterday, he said. And David says, look, guy, I know you just signed up for this, and if you want to leave, leave. You don't need to. Now, listen, 
Think about this. David is on the verge of war. To be giving troops away, to be sending troops home, we would say, humanly speaking, that is a stupid thing to do. But David is what? Doing the right thing. And he's saying, look, you are just now engaging with me, so you don't need to stay. You can go home if you want to. He didn't think it was fair for them to get caught up in all the whirlpool that was his life. He says, look, I'm, in, I'm dealing with this. I'm in a bad place. And there's no, it, now, it didn't make good military sense, but David, even as his world is crumbling around him, he continued to do the right thing by the people that he served. A third thing that David does is David sends the ark back to Jerusalem, the ark of the covenant. Now, David is king, right? I know Absalom's pushing the buttons and he thinks that he's going to be, but David's the king. He, as God's chosen king, could have said, no, the ark is going to stay with us. He's going to stay with us. He could have determined Absalom is not worthy to have the ark in the city in which he's going to be. And David refused all of those. He refused to use the ark as leverage. It was not a bargaining chip in this. He says, this is where it belongs. In the city of God. The Ark of the Covenant belongs in the city of God, and that's where it's going to stay. Again, he knew just because things were difficult for him was not a time to play with God's commandments, to back away from those. Friend, are you putting this together to do the right thing, no matter what's happening around it? He demonstrated great faith that God was in control, that God was going to bless his obedience. I suspect a lot of the times when we're dealing with something difficult and we're not sure about what decision to make and all this, I, I, I think a lot of times it's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we just want to do what we want to do rather than what God would want us to do. So many times it's not that we don't know the right answer. It's that we don't do the right thing. So what we do is we go shopping for our ideas. So we seek the counsel, and we go to all sorts of people trying to find somebody out there that's got something that sounds good to me. I know what God says, but I'm going to find somebody who's got something that sounds good to me or for someone that will agree with what I want to do. David avoided this trap. He chose to work on God's principles. So if you're in a place right now where, where, where somebody's putting pressure on you at work or you're going through whatever you're going through, do the right thing. Do the godly thing. And here's the kind of ideas. To work toward forgiveness rather than resentment and revenge. When you're wronged, it's easy to feel cornered. To do the right thing. Maybe some of you are dealing with financial stuff. Wait to buy something. Wait, you know, make, a, make, make good decisions. Build your relationship with the Lord. All these right things that we could do. It is always right to do what God says, even if it's not easy to follow, even if it doesn't make good sense, but David did the right thing. But there's a third thing here in that David did, another one of those deep theological thoughts. He sought God's help. You need to seek God's help. Those of you who've been with us for our whole study have known that it's not always been David's way, right? There were many times in his life where he was, Man, he was a great military leader, so he'd just up and he would go. He'd make rash decisions. He wouldn't do what God wanted. But David is doing better with this. I think that's a sign of a person with God's heart. He said, we're getting better. <laughs> we're, we're getting better. We're, we're, learning to, we're learning the lessons. And we're beginning to trust God. We're beginning to put more faith in, in what he's telling us to do. So throughout this whole ordeal here at the end of his life, David is consistently seeking the Lord. His faith is firmly rooted in the fact. And as wave after wave of crushing blows comes upon David, he reminded himself and he reminded those around him that God is with us, that God is in control. And he did not rush to judgments. And he did not rush to decisions. He's willing to wait on the Lord. prime example is when he went up on top of the mountain to worship on the Mount of Olives to worship God and to seek his help. 
when he heard that his trusted advisor had been taken away, he, he brings it to the Lord and he begins to pray to God. And what did he say? Lord, make his, make his counsel foolishness. Scholars tell us that we believe that Psalm 3 was written right after David is forced out of the city or leaves the city. In Psalm 3, listen to it, verses 1, 2, and 3. O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. <laughs> Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God, but you, O Lord, are my shield about me, my glory in the one who lifts my head. He reminds himself and everybody around him that God is in control, that ultimately God is going to do what is best. He's going to do the right thing. And David makes this super spiritually mature statement. This is something only a mature person in the faith can say. And he says it in 2 Samuel 15, 26. He says, let him do with me as it seems good for him. He's talking about God. Man. Do you pray like that? Or do you say, God, I need this and I need that. Or God, you know what I'm not. You know, and and we, we, we paint our, our portrait what we want life to look like. That's what... Many prayer lives look like. But David says, as he wants to do with me, let him do it. Are you willing to walk with that kind of faith? God, whatever it is, I'll take it. Whatever it is that's got me in your will, that'll put me on the path that I need to be on to become who you want me to be, I'm willing to accept it. This is truly saying that I believe you, God. I believe that you are in control. I believe that you are the creator and the sustainer of all that is. And I believe that even in my finite mind and what I believe my life should be, that you have the greatest counsel and that you are the one that will see this through. That's hard to apply. I'll be honest with you. Because when things start happening to us, we, we, get, a, we get afraid of ourselves. And we begin to waver in our faith. Mm. See, it's one thing to say, oh, you need to wait upon the Lord. And it's easy to say that when you've got nothing to wait for, right? <laughs> when things are going well. But when things start to happen and get out of control and it seems like everything in your life is changing, it's only natural for you to be impatient. But David waited. He waited. For God's counsel. Now, what you get it? Waiting doesn't mean sitting down on your rear end, okay? Let's be sure about that, okay? David still moved the people out of the city. He still rallied the troops. He even set up some spies. Did you notice that? David set up some spies. He says, you go back, you spend your time with Absalom, and we'll set up this little working relationship so that I can have a conversation and be able to hear what's happening in Absalom's, in Absalom's camp. So David didn't just roll over. Don't get that in your mind. David is saying, oh, here comes Absalom. David is thinking ahead. He's putting people in place so that he will be able to hear what's happening inside of Absalom's camp. David continued to lead the people. He led them in worship, and he's going to lead them in the wilderness to help them. So God doesn't want you to sit down and wait on him. What he wants you to do is you do what you can do. You do your part. God doesn't reward laziness, okay? He doesn't reward laziness. Everybody in the Bible, I'm losing my voice. Everybody in the Bible that I find that God used mightily was really busy when God called them. They were really busy. They were doing something. Moses was guarding sheep or leading sheep, and, and, and people were busy. So David was ready. He was prepared for battle. He employed good strategy. He was willing to march out in the wilderness. All of those, he stepped up to do the hard stuff. So while you're waiting on God's answer in your life or whatever your, your situation is, do some things to, to better yourself toward that goal, okay? God's not wanting you. Maybe you need to seek counsel. So let me give you some out. Seek counsel. Or maybe you need to take up a job to pay some bills. Or, you know, cut back on spending. Ask for forgiveness. Worship with God's people. Reach out to people that you've wronged. Doing the stuff 
around life to keep you on track. When things get difficult, we seek God's help, but we continue to live in his honor, to live him glory by the way we live our life. If we're going to ever believe that God's in control, you've got to spend time with him. When I see David here in the midst, of just on the verge of war and in the midst of moving an entire city of people, he's still worshiping. His worship is a priority. It is a priority for him to, to be with God and to meditate on his character and to understand who he is and to, to lead the people in worship, all of those things. So, God recorded this story for us for a reason, okay? So I'm going to talk to those of you right now. Some of you are sitting in this audience right now, and, and you feel the waves of life overwhelming you. So put that. You feel the waves of life overwhelming you. If that's you, if you're in the midst of that right now, just, 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 just take some lessons straight from what we've been talking about. Draw from the strength of your friends, Okay? Find godly people that won't tell you what you want to hear, but tell you what you should hear. That give you direction that doesn't please them or please you, but pleases God. You need to lean on those friends. Don't run from them. Look around this place. You find, that's the reason that God put together the church, the body, so that you and I support each other. Find strength. That's what the body of Christ is about. Number two, do what God says. Do the right thing. This is not the time to compromise your values. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how bad it looks. I don't care if it's been in the paper. I don't care if you, everybody in town's talking about it. I don't care. It is not the time to compromise your values. It is time to get right with the Lord, to do what is right, to be a person of character. But a third thing is to trust God's character. Trust God's character. Find those verses that remind you that he is the judge of the earth. He is the only one that I ultimately will answer to. You understand? Cling to the promise that he is in control with everything within you. But to another group, this message is, you don't need this message right now. You're not in a major thing. Oh, you're, you're still going to have some bad days. But you're not in a major crisis. Life seems pretty good right now, okay? Well, guess what you ought to do with this time? You know what you do in the times of peace? You prepare for times of war. That's what you do. You need to be preparing yourself right now. So how do you do that? Cultivate friendships. <laughs> the very, these are going to be the same thing. You cultivate friendships. What I mean by that is that you begin to be friends with others. That's how you make good friends. You are a good friend. And you begin to work on those relationships. You begin to demonstrate that you are there for people. And you need to encourage them and lift them up. You need to be who you want to minister to you in the future because that's who they're going to be. Second thing, you need to learn to walk in obedience. To walk in obedience. You know, a lot of times uh, this fall, we've got a new wave of folks going to go off to college, okay? And some of those are going to go into the field of education. They want to be teachers. And you know what? You can go to college and they teach you all this stuff, but they cannot prepare you for a classroom of children. <laughs> you understand that? It's all theory until you get all those kids around you. So they can't prepare you the full way. The facts are of little value until they're put into practice. In your life, many of you today, this morning, know what God's commandments are. You know the right thing to do. You know how to treat people. You know how you ought to be praying. You know how you ought to be attending worship. You know all the facts, but it's no good till you put it into practice. Right now is when you need to be learning obedience, to start living by God's commands, to learn to trust him right now so that when your life falls to pieces, you'll have that relationship strong. That's the last one. You develop a relationship with God. I encourage you to study God's character, okay? To study God's character. By who he is, by promise. We preached about that on Wednesday nights. I'm, I'm thinking about putting them up on the website, even though we didn't, we weren't doing, we just do Sunday mornings. I'm thinking about doing those because they were so good about who, Gary, who God is 
and trust in his character. So here's what I want you to do. Develop some consistency in your life right now. Some consistency in your life right now. See, these stories that we are going through in the Old Testament, centuries old, stories of Job and David and Moses, and all these things, we need to see them as allowed for us. They, they're for our, the healing of our wounds. I was fishing a while back, and I got a nasty cut on my hand. I, I forgot I don't know how I got it, but I, I'm always getting cuts on them and everything. And, and I, you know, I washed it out in the river because the river's real clean, you know. So I washed it out in the river, and, uh, and it kept bleeding. It kept doing it. So I got out my super glue, and I glued that thing back, you know. That, you know. And, I, and I was out in my boat a few days after that. Of course, it all pussed up. I had to clean all that up when I got That's not the story. Found, I had a first aid kit in the boat, a little pack I'd put in there. had a first aid kit. But you know what? I didn't use it. Forgot it was there. How much good did it do me? None. None. See, these stories and, and, and the truths of God's Word and the character of the people in the Bible are there for our healing, for our healing, for our protection, for us to, to grow. But we've got to use the tools. Oh, friend, it breaks my heart to think how many times after Sunday morning, something in the sermon, surely I've talked for 45 minutes, surely something I said had, a, had a, got in, into your heart, and then you walk away with that. That's like, that's like putting the first aid kit in your pocket and bleeding to death the whole time. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. God shows us David here, a man whose world is turning apart, is, is whirling out of control, and and I see him pause and do the right thing. It is refreshing, and I encourage you to follow that model, to follow that model, okay? Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for this, this story, Lord. And Lord, there are times when we just we get in the midst of trouble in our life, and we just feel like we're all alone, that we just can't possibly go on. And Lord, just these storms leave these, these terrible, deep wounds. But God, you preserve these stories as a healing for us to let us see that, Lord, even the people in the Bible that we look up to struggled and they had tough, difficult things in their life. But God, you carried them through and you'll do the same for us. So Lord, I pray today because I know there's people in here today, they, they just feel like the world is coming apart at the seams. Father, they need to feel you today. They need to know that they're not alone. So, Father, I pray that they run to you and they find comfort and peace. And, and Father, there are people here today that when they come upon even, even just the bad days, not that the world's, Lord, they struggle with it because they don't have a relationship with you. And Father, I pray for them to, to come to you, Lord, and, and just bear their hearts and say, I need you to be my Lord. God, bless right now with your Holy Spirit's work in our hearts, Lord, that we would do honor for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You stand up. We're going to sing.